we want to welcome you to another edition of God's Living Word, a program brought to you by First Presbyterian Church of Greenville, Ohio. First Presbyterian is located in historic downtown Greenville at 114 East 4th Street. We can be reached by phone at 937-548-3188. We hope as a result of this service that you will find that our message is uplifting and meaningful to help you in your daily walk in spiritual life as a Christian. Throughout the week, we have several ministries that I know will be of help to you. Wednesdays in particular, there are several Bible studies for both adults as well as children. Our Logos ministry is for children preschool through fifth grade. We have Jam, Jesus and Me for junior highs and then our senior high ministry Wednesday evening. If you do not have a church home, we invite you to participate and be involved in our worshiping community, whether on the airwaves or certainly personally in the congregation. At this time, we'd like to invite you to be part of our family of faith here at First Presbyterian as we worship the Lord and listen to God's living word. Uh, when we get to the sermon, we're talking about the call of Abram. And so calling is an important thing. We are called to worship every week when we get here. And hopefully through the message uh, today, we will learn more about what it means to be called. Come, let us worship and bow down. For he is our God. Let's continue to worship now as we sing the mighty power of God.
Let's pray. Father, we do indeed thank you today for all that we see on the ground and in the skies and the path along our way. We pray with the Israelites, the Shema, that you would be our God, that you would be before all, and that you would be in our path, that we would hang your word on our doorposts, and that it would be written on our hearts by your spirit. We thank you so much for the word of God. We thank you for being called into fellowship with you by the Holy Spirit and that this call rests on the truth of that word and on the work of the cross. We do pray that you would continue to make us one even as we are one in you. We pray that you would continue to bind up this community with the love of Christ, that we would sacrifice and care and lay down our lives for one another just as you have done for us. We do pray now for those who are in need in our congregation, for those who are dealing with issues of health and are struggling. We pray that you would be with them. We pray for those who are battling illnesses, cancer and Parkinson's and all the other uh, things that are destroying and getting into this creation and ruining it. We pray that you would join us now mightily to the promise of the cross that when Jesus came, he came to heal the sick. He came to deliver us. He came to give sight to the blind. He came to reverse this awful curse that sits upon your creation and redeem and bring back everything to yourself and put it under your feet. We do pray that you would comfort us. We need your comfort in times of need. We pray that you would comfort those who are hurting because of family and friends that are not doing well. We pray that you would bind us up and fix our, our wounded hearts in Christ. We do thank you for the promise of the gospel that is true. We cling to it in faith. We walk by faith and not by sight, even though these things are daunting and difficult and are painful. We do understand that you love us and that you died for us and you rose for us and you sit at your Father's right hand and you go to him with our cares and those places that are too painful to speak. We know that the Spirit himself translates and brings our cares to you. We thank you for this wonderful blessing to be in relationship with you and that you are strong enough to handle our burdens. We thank you now. We pray for your presence here that we would continue to worship and be made new in Christ. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's continue to worship now uh, with the Word of God. And as I'm reading this, I'm going to invite our second reader to come on up. And uh, yeah, he, you can come on up and I'll read the first reading here. You may be seated. Thank you very much. The Word of God is able to save our souls and we read it in uh, in conjunction with uh, our worship service because we are instructed by it and we are brought under it. So listen intently, dear Christian. From Matthew 24, 32 to 35. From the free fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you must know that summer is near. So also when you see all things, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Hear the word of the Lord. Philippians 3, 8 through 11. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish, in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. that I hit up there. Do you think you could easily do that by yourself? Okay, what if somebody you really trusted, like your mother, took you back to the Jenners and helped you find your stuff? Could you have done it then? Would you willingly go with your mother and go find it if that was the case? <laughs> That's a little better, right? I mean, because you trust your mother. If your mother took you by your hand and led you back to where the Jenners were, to get the special thing that I have for you, you could do it, right? <coughs> I think so, yeah, because it's a lot easier if you have somebody you trust to do that. Okay, we were done with that. So, <laughs> so anyway, basically, do you guys know who Abraham was? He's like the founder of like all of all of Jude all of the Jewish pop population religion and all, all of the Christian religion. He's he's like the the first person that really demonstrated the true faith in, in the Lord and true trust in him and that God promised to him that he would lead him to a promised land and that when he that the promised land he would have all he would have blessings on all his descendants and there would be more of his descendants than there were stars in the sky or grains of sand on the beach, right? So even though it is a huge act of faith for him to say, yes, Lord, and go out and follow, he was able to do it because he knew God was good, like your mother, looks look out for you and wants you and wants the best for him as, as your folks want the best for you, right? So I will have you, now that you do not have a cover on your eyes, I'm going to have you go all the way back, and you can pick them up 
from the jetters who will raise their hands so you can actually see them. You can go all the way back around that way and they will give you what I got for you. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for the faith of Abraham and for the trustworthiness and love of God that we can, we can pray to him and we know that he listens and that he is seeking what is best for us. Amen. says that until your work on earth is done when we talk of the cross we talk of a work that is done it's done as far as it goes that God declares you righteous and admits you into the kingdom but it's not done from the standpoint that we still have sin we still need to confess and we still are waiting for that time when we will stand in glory with him so as such we have as part of our liturgy the requirement or the, the duty, the desire to confess our sins and to be reassured of God's love for us. Let's confess corporately what you see on the screen, and then I'll give you a moment to confess privately. God of grace, we confess that we have elevated the things of this world above you. We have made idols of possessions and people and used your name for causes that are not consistent with your purposes. We have permitted our schedules to come first and have not taken time to worship you. We have not always honored those who guided us in life. We have participated in systems that take life instead of give it. We have been unfaithful in our covenant relationships. We have yearned for and sometimes taken that which is not ours, and we have misrepresented others' intentions. Forgive us, O oh God, for the many ways we fall short of your glory. Help us to learn to live together according to your ways through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray in Jesus' name, and it's in Jesus that we find our assurance. So take this from the Lord, dear believer, that this is your assurance. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the outcasts of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. The gospel is true, and you are forgiven. Let's stand and respond to that truth with singing the doxology. Say our affirmation of faith together. 
I've been giving us some ever increasing uh, avenues through which to be affirmed in our faith, and here's yet another one. Let's say this together. This is the good news that we have received, in which we stand and by which we are saved if we hold it fast, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter, and then to the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. That indeed is true. Let's continue to worship now. I'm going to invite our guests up to, to uh, give us a special offering while they're coming up to, to offer their uh, worship to the Lord. I remind you that we have tithe boxes at the back of the sanctuary. It's uh, important that we tithe, not because God needs our money. He is abundant. He's overflowing. He's full of all that he would ever need. But it is an act of your worship, an act of your trust, an act of your faith to tithe your money. And it's an act of your testimony that God indeed has overflowed your cup, that he has given you what you have and you owe your life to him. This is our opportunity to worship this way. We are so thankful to have our guests. And let's now enjoy the music.
Tammy and Mike, thank you both for your wonderful gift to us. And uh, thank you for uh, using your gifts to God's glory. And thanks again to everybody for the opportunity to address you from God's word. This is the word which is able to save our souls, as I mentioned earlier. We are in the book of Genesis, and we are making our way through. We have finished the first 11 chapters, and today is somewhat of a milestone in terms of the book of Genesis and where we're at. It is the call of Abram. It is God's move from the uh, prehistoric elements of, of the world that we would have known to his dealings with one family, with one set of people that is going to bring about all of the promises that he has made. So it is a, a very good day to be here to start learning about Abram and the call of the Lord to Abram. Let's read our text. It's in Genesis chapter 12, starting in verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. And when they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. Let's pray. Father, we pray, as we must, that you would be our teacher. We pray, as we must, that you would humble us with your word, that you would send your spirit with power to do its work by this word, that it would clean out the corners of our hearts that we seek to hide from you. We do pray that you would help this word to accomplish its work. We thank you for its powerful call upon our lives. We thank you that by it, and it alone, we understand who you are and who we are. We pray that you would continue to bless this congregation with faith, to trust and follow and respond to the call of Scripture upon our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So if I wonder, um, if we would think about the Bible stories uh, that we're so familiar with within the pages of Scripture... I wonder if we would come up with a, a short list of times where all seemed lost. The context of the story we have here before us with Abraham is actually a dead end. It's a story that would teach us about hopelessness, really. Uh, if we were to look back over even just the first 11 chapters of the Bible, we would find often that humanity was at a dead end. I mean, think back to Adam and Eve. They're kicked out of the garden. And everything that they know about this world is blocked off from them with the angel passing back and forth, not letting them in. They must have felt that this is it. We've lost our home. We're out in the wilderness. Or think back to Noah. God looks over the entire face of the earth and he sees nothing but wickedness. And he says, I have no way to go. All I can do is flood the entire place. Or think back to even uh, Cain and Abel, if you want to go back in that story. You've got two children, and one murders the other one. And the one that's left is the wicked one. And the good one is gone. And you've got one wicked person left. It must have seemed like a dead end. What are we to make of it? 
And you might not think of this story as being the context of hopelessness, but it really is. It's a story that begs the question that God is going to choose and start his work, and he chooses a 75-year-old idolater. He, this, this is an idolater. He's an idol worshiper who's 75 years old. He doesn't have any children. His wife is barren. And God says, that's what I'm going to start with. It's a very unlikely person in an unlikely place, an unlikely plan. In Abram's mind, it was hopeless. They're at the end of their rope. He's getting too old to have a child. The patriarch of the family, Terah, has died at the age of 205, and they've already moved from Ur to Haran. And presumably, they don't have very much in the way of to, pres to preserve their family or provide for their family. All seems lost. There's no bloodline to carry on. It's the end of the line. It's a dead end. It's a story set in the context of hopelessness. And it's at this time in this story that an incredibly applicable thing comes to you and me. Ephesians 3.12 says this, Remember that you, at the time, were separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. I remember a time in my life where that sentence was true. I was not a part of the church. I was not a part of God's covenant family. I knew nothing of the Bible. And my life was as hopeless as Sarah's barrenness. I was without hope and without God in the world. But then I went to a Bible study. It was in the basement of some kids' homes, and they were sharing the four spiritual laws with each other and saying what the gospel was. And I heard a call upon my life. And suddenly, where there was no hope, there finally was. And that's what the story is here today. Without the call in Genesis 12 to Abraham, you and I would inevitably be people without hope and without God in the world. For it's through this call to Abraham and the faith of Abraham that we will eventually be given access to the hope found in the promise of Jesus Christ. Christ is the whole reason that we have access to God through faith. But it is by faith, the faith of Abraham, that we're instructed today of the operations and the inner workings of grace. That's what we're going to learn. So the antidote to hopeless, hopelessness in the Bible, the antidote to hopelessness, is the voice of God breaking into the creation and calling us out of it. God calls the most unlikely people in the most unlikely places, like Dark County, he calls them to be saved. In short, the key to significance in this world and safety, we talked last week about all of the ways that uh, the people in the Tower of Babel story were looking for safety and significance, and they didn't have it. The confusion that God sent them into, the separation of the languages and scattering them across the earth should have seemed like hopelessness. But it's not hopeless when you have the effectual call of God, the voice of God breaking in and saying, I'm going to create life again. It was that same word that broke in and created life in Genesis 1. So Abraham is that person. Abraham led a great life. He, he is named in the Old Testament 234 times. In the New Testament, he's named 74 times. That's an amazing amount of times for someone to be mentioned in Scripture. Can you get your head around that? Over 300 times he's mentioned in the Bible. And after the life of Jesus Christ, perhaps the life of Abraham is the greatest life ever lived on this earth. So we should study, and this is a quote from Spurgeon. By the way, I'm going to keep the slides a little minimal today. I'm just going to give you the outline. And that hopefully will help us all to focus on what's going on. And um, we can always switch back to giving you all the full quotes if we want. 
but uh, I th thought I would try it this way today. So the quote from Spurgeon is this, we should study the history of the father of the faithful. Abraham, the man of faith, is a type of all believing men and women, and the narrative of his life, if rightly considered, is the mirror of the history of all the saints of God. Where does a great life come from? That's my question for you. What is its source? Where does a great life come from? What does a life of greatness look like? The answer is you must have the call of God. You must be called. I want to talk about the call of God for you in three ways. The call of God is transformational, it is missional, and it is evangelical. First, the transformational nature of God's call. The call of God changes the lives of these two young people in the Bible here, Sarai and Abram. They are at the dead end we talked about. The call of God is absolutely necessary to anyone who would want to live a great life. And might I say that the measure of a great life in our day in America in the 21st century might be just a bit askew. We consider greatness fame, fortune, getting on the television. You know, that guy that's, uh, you know, got the guy doing the weather report and he's back there saying, hey, mom. And he goes throughout the rest of his week, I was on TV. <laughs> Our measure of greatness is just a little bit lower than God's plan of greatness for you. And it begins with his call upon your life to do something glorious for his name. He will make your name great in order to accomplish his purposes. The call is always a call from something, and simultaneously it's a call to something, from something and to something. That's the call of God. Jesus said to the brothers fishing, he would make them fishers of men. He calls them from fishing for fish to fishing for men. To Abram, he says, I will make you a great nation. And this was transformational for Abram. God could have chosen anyone. Do you realize that uh, Melchizedek is alive at this time? God could have said, Melchizedek, I'm going to pick your family. You're a, you're a wonderful priest. You're an amazing man. You're a great leader. You probably have children. But he didn't. He chose Abram, a 75-year-old idolater. He picks a person who's aging without prospects, without power, without potential. He chooses a wanderer. And he says to Abraham, follow me, this is the call, follow me and I will make your name great. That's the call. A great life starts with that call. Uh, St. Augustine, uh, I'll call him Augustine, although because that's how I'm accustomed to pronouncing his name. I think technically it's Augustine. So forgive me if I'm saying it the wrong way. But perhaps you know of him. He's considered the premier theologian scholar and teacher from 396 through 1600. So Augustine was the premier scholar and theologian for over a thousand years, and he still read. He wrote more than 10 million words. It's a lot of books. You couldn't read all of Augustine. If you meet someone that says they did, you just got to realize they're not telling you the whole truth. It's impossible to read everything he wrote. Among the great treatises, he wrote a work on the Trinity. He wrote another one called The City of God, which introduces the world to the notion of the visible and invisible church. This was an order of monks. There was an order of monks, the Augustinian monks. It was the Augustinian monks that Luther was a part of. Luther, studying the Bible as Augustine taught it a thousand years earlier, initiates the Reformation. This is an immensely influential person. Augustine's too uh, influential to even kind of try to gather up and measure what he's done for the world. So why do I tell you about Augustine? Well, it's because he was once a young and talented man in a world of sin. He was living his life as a hedonist. He was a man of the world. He was considered... Uh, he considered his status and his kind of oratory, his rhetoric, his teaching positions, his scholarly works, he considered all that to be where life was at, where greatness was at. And sometime in the year 386, 
Well, first of all, you got to know that his mother, Monica, prayed for him all the time. And in 386, Augustine was living in Milan, and his friend Alepius and him were hanging out outdoors. And while outdoors, Augustine heard the voice, and it was a child's song singing, pick it up and read it, pick it up and read it. He thought it was a children singing the song over the back of another wall. And he began to open his Bible. Realizing it was a command from God, he picked it up, and he opened the scriptures, and he located the Bible. He just did one of these things. And he read it, and it turns out that the verse that he opened up to was Romans 13, 13 and 34 to 14. It says, not in carousing or drunkenness or in sexual excess or lust, not in quarreling or in jealousy, rather put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. That's what he read. And he became a Christian. It was the call of God on his life. He became a Christian. He felt his heart was flooded with light. He turned totally from his life of sin. He was baptized by Ambrose. And he became a priest in four years. He became the bishop of Milan in nine years. And then he started writing all those wonderful things we talked about. His spiritual autobiography is called Augustine's Confessions. You might have heard of it. It is about 280 pages translated, and it is a 280-page prayer. His biography told in form of prayer to God. It's an amazing work. They still read it at every seminary or Bible college. So the call of God comes and it transforms you just like it transformed Augustine. When God calls, the Spirit of God changes the heart of stone to a heart of flesh. In doing so, your citizenship, we talked about the city, the two cities last week, your citizenship is transferred from being merely a human citizen of the world to a citizen of the kingdom of God. It's a transfer of your allegiances. A life of true greatness can only be built on this call. It's foundational. Jesus taught it too. If anyone would come after me, what does he have to do? He has to hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters. Yes, even his own life, Jesus says. So therefore, if any one of you wants to follow me, if you do not renounce all that you have, you cannot be my disciple. Why? Why does Jesus make it so hard? Why so extreme, Jesus? Don't you know that our membership's going to plummet after you start teaching this kind of stuff? You're never going to get anybody talking like that. But that's the call. It's a call that comes, and it does a work in the heart, inside, and it is a work that you cannot do for yourself. And it joins you with God on a journey of faith and transformation. Philippians 1.6 says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will do what? Bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So the call of God is the beginning of the journey. You see, Abraham's life is being transformed. He's being brought along by God, taught by God how to walk faithfully with God, how to trust God, how to rely upon God, how to press through believing God's promise when it seems like you're at a hopeless dead end you realize that we have to be taught how to do that as people. I didn't know how to do that when I listened to the Bible study in the basement that one night. It's been 22, 25 years now, and I'm still learning how to do that, how to press through, how to trust God. So those are the reason for the call. Holy, the Holy Spirit has to communicate in your inmost being and cause your spiritual life to be created here. The Word of God and the Spirit of God meet, and life is created. Certainly, it's a wonderful thought. Uh, you know, you've got a lot of callings on your life. You know, some people go to college, and like the semester before you pick your major, you start really getting interested in that thing. And you say, ah, I got it. I'm going to be, for me, it was a history major. Or maybe it's math, or maybe it's science, or space, or something. You find it, and you say, ah, that's my calling. 
But this calling is categorically different than that kind of calling. That's a calling as in like something you get excited about. This is a transformation. There, you know, another kind of calling would be like 140 to 180 years ago in this region of America, there was the Great Awakening and all the revival preachers would come through and they were, they were called Methodists because they had a method. They would preach a certain way and play a certain song and then they would have a certain altar call and they would expect a certain decision. And that's why it's called Methodist. So there's nothing wrong with Methodist, but the call to come up and accept Jesus in that situation is categorically different than this call. That call says that you somehow get to choose, yes, I'll follow, or no, I won't follow. And, and while that's true on the face of it for you and me, the call I'm describing here is different the Bible says you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Dead people don't get to choose anything. You need a call that actually awakens and puts life into you. You can't be great without this call. It's a call that transforms, and it primarily transforms you from being dead to being alive. At the time when Abram receives the call, Abram, Abram, go. At the time he receives that call, he's dead prior to the call. He's alive after the call. So the second thing, it's missional. Let's look at the first word following the call of Abraham. It says what? Go. That's the first word out of God's mouth. It says, the moment you are called and you are transformed... This transformation is characterized as the word poema. It's a work of art. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says this, if anyone's in Christ, he is a new creation, a new work of art. In that same text where it says, uh, you are dead in your transgressions and sins, and you've been saved in the, by grace, and this faith is not, uh, grace is not of your own, but it's a gift of God, the very next verse says, God created works in advance for you to walk in. It's Ephesians 2.10. So you're supposed to go and find those works. You're supposed to go. It's missional. The first word of the text says go. You might be thinking to yourself, that's only for Abraham. That's his thing. That was a long time ago in a different kind of place. 4,000 years ago. It's not, it's not about me. It's got nothing to do with me. I beg to differ. Do you realize that every instance of God calling people in the Bible is followed by a go? Every single one. God calls Moses and says, go to the Pharaoh. God calls Isaiah. He sees him on the throne, high and lifted up, holy, holy, holy. I'm a man of unclean lips. And then what does he say? Who, is, who, uh, who will go for us? That's what God asks him. Who will go for us? And he says, here am I. Send me. He's sent Nehemiah has an encounter with God and is sent. Peter meets Jesus in Luke 5, and he doesn't realize it, but Jesus is going to say, go feed my sheep. The Apostle Paul meets Jesus on the way to persecute the church, and he's called, transformed, and then all of a sudden he says, you are my apostle to the Gentiles. Apostle means a sent one. Go. The King James in verse 12, 1 says, get thee, get thee. It's an old way of saying, go out of your country, go out, get thee out. <laughs> it's the old way of saying go. You and I are called to mission. You're made with good works, picked out in advance for you to participate in. No more hiding in your comfort zones, not in your home, not on the couch with the clicker. Not in your pew where you're sitting every week in the same spots. I like that I can find you, but. <laughs> Go. Why? Because there's a gap that exists. Do you realize there's a gap that exists between your actual experience of the Christian life, the one we talk about when we're at church together here, there's a gap between that and the actual place where God wants you to be which is out there on mission. Do you realize there's a gap there? 
We might think we're living the Christian life, but God has got greatness in store for you when he calls you. He's got work in store for you when he calls you. He's got to go in store when he calls you. And we don't get the go if we're just here, comfortable in our comfort zones. To this moment, you have not yet embraced 100%. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say it. To this moment, you have not yet embraced 100% of all that God has prepared for you to do in this life. That's just true. After transformation by this call, <clears throat> you will be sent on mission. You are sent even though you may not know where you're going yet. Maybe you feel, I don't know where I'm going. This is uncomfortable. I don't have to, I don't know where God wants me to, what he wants me to do. But God says in this text, does he tell him where to go? No, he says, I will show you. He says, go to the land, and then he said, I'll show you where it's at. So you might not know exactly, but the going, follow where God's at, and you will find where he's showing you. I remember uh, early in my Christian faith, I, uh, I went to a Christian conference, and there were missionaries speaking about becoming missionaries, and I was 16 years old or 17 years old. I'd been a Christian for maybe a year. And... When I became a Christian, I was really good at making deals with God. I remember sitting on the sofa in the basement there, and I became a Christian. I was telling God, now, God, this doesn't mean I'm going to become a religious fanatic or anything. And then I remember going to this conference and hearing the missionaries speak, and they're like, you should be a missionary to this place or that place. And, this. and, you know, I would only barely eat a hamburger. I wouldn't even eat it if there were cheese on it. So I was, like, really picky. I wasn't going to go to some strange country where I couldn't eat the food. I was making deals with God. I was saying, oh, you know. This is good. I'll go to, maybe I'll go to England. <laughs> and little did I know at that time he would send me to South Korea where I'm eating eel and all kinds of weird stuff. There's a go involved, and you don't know where you're going to go, but God will call you to there. Dark County is where I ended up. I never knew when I became a Christian in that basement I would end up in Dark County preaching the gospel at a church in Greenville, Ohio. There's a go involved in your call. Corey Ten Boom said it this way, you do not need to be afraid to trust God with an unknown future when you trust in a known God. You know God and that's enough. It's a matter of faith. There's no if. You don't need to know everything. You don't need a detailed map. By faith, Abraham went to the place he did not know. He says, I'll show you. I'll bless you. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll make you into a great nation, Abram. And we are descendants of this call. We are descendants of the call to Abram. We are called by God and we are sent. And we are sent to the nations. You know, the nations are right here in Greenville. There are lots of people from different nationalities and races that live right here. You're called by a di divine appointment to be sent. The question for us becomes this. What does it look like for me to live my life on mission? What does it look like? That, that presupposes the idea that you understand what the mission is. You understand what the mission is when you become a Christian? When you're called by God, do you understand what he has called you to? He calls you from something, but he calls you to something. We are to gather and we are to perfect. We talked about that at session this last week. We are to make disciples. VBS is a ministry of this church. It's going to happen in a couple of weeks. We got a meeting about it this afternoon. That's a gathering mission. If you know people with kids that don't have a place to attend church or don't have a place to hear the gospel, this is a mission. It's a go time. Go and invite. Jesus was always going and inviting. And when people said, hey, they're not coming, he said, well, go invite other people, more people, people who will. I went to GA last month. It was in Denver, and at GA... There was a uh, person, there's a woman being commissioned to become a, uh, an evangelist, which is another way to, to ordain somebody for ministry 
who doesn't have all the degrees and the, you know, hasn't passed all the tests and all that stuff. And she was living in Overland Park, Kansas or something, this tiny little town. And uh, she was finding homeless people and bringing food to them and teaching the gospel to them. And she was sitting in coffee shops and she was, she was just literally walking around town meeting people who were available to be met. And what she was finding was she was starting to gather them and a church was starting to form. So she came to GA to get the permission of the assembly, our EPC assembly, to vote to give her the title of an evangelist so that she could plant a church among people who were the down and outers in this tiny little town. She didn't have funding. She didn't have a building. They met in parks. They didn't have pianists as wonderful as Terry is. I love Terry. I'll, I'll sing her praises every week. But they didn't have anything. And she knew that she was on mission. She was explaining an amazing faith, asking for this title to go and plant a church. She didn't have all the training, but she had God. And she was following him, being faithful to the call. So the example makes me think of a second word in this text. It says leave, right? Go, leave your country, leave your family, leave this and go. Go beyond your little aches and pains. You must leave something behind. Peter and James left their nets behind. The woman at the well left her jar behind. Elisha left his dad and followed Elijah. Paul left everything. He says, I'll count everything a loss. I'm leaving everything behind. It's all loss. Whoever would gain his life must first lose it or leave it behind, Jesus said. Count it all loss in order to be missional. In order for Abraham to follow God, and his call to bless all the families of the earth, he first had to leave his country, leave his people, leave his father's household, and like the, disciple, like the disciples, he left. The gospel demands transcendent allegiance. What does that mean, transcendent allegiance? It means an allegiance to things that are not the normal ties that bind. We are joined together here by a transcendent allegiance. We are... We are joined by the Holy Spirit that lives in you, lives in me, and has joined us to Jesus. That transcends, it trumps all other allegiances. It's much more demanding. In fact, it's a call that Jesus put to his own followers. What kind of person, he says, sets out on a journey or sets out to build a tower and doesn't first do what? Consider the cost. Did you, when you signed up to meet Jesus, did you stop and consider the cost that he's demanded transcendent allegiance from all of you? That's a very difficult call. Like I said, you cannot be great without this call. That's what a call is from God. This call requires a whole rearrangement of your priorities, a rearrangement of what identifies you, your cultural communities. It requires that you identify with Christ. It requires that you depart. It requires that you go. And this is the last point. It's evangelical. It's gospel-centered. Notice with me that Abraham is called to a place, but that place will mean nothing. The place he's going, the land he's going, will mean nothing without what? without an heir. It will mean nothing if he doesn't have a child. He must live in this place based on the promise that God would indeed give him an heir, provide a son. The land was a down payment, but the full delivery of the promise was the son because it's through Jesus that we will be saved eventually. The call keeps coming. He's called 12 times between chapter 12 and chapter 24. God has to keep coming and reaffirming this call. We're going to see it over and over again. And we talk about Abraham's wonderful faith, but a lot of times he walks outside and says, I still don't have this son. And God has to remind him, look at the stars. It's going to happen. Have you noticed that from this point on, in the Bible, every time we read the scriptures, we follow only one nation. We only follow Israel. 
when they interact with the Canaanites, when they interact with the Hiv uh, Hivites, the Perizzites, and the Egyptians, or the Persians, or the Romans, we actually are only for fo following one of those groups of people. We're following Israel. And we're following God's promise to Israel that Jesus would be born and die on the cross and save us. We're only following that one nation. The promise flows from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob to Moses to Joseph to Ruth to Jesse to David to the exiles to, to Jesus. It starts here with this call. Jesus is baptized in the Jordan in his earthly ministry, and it was on this occasion that God descended in the person of the Holy Spirit and said, this is my son, my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. It's this calling, it's the identity of God saying that this is the one who will be on mission for me. Jesus' whole life was a calling. His whole life was devoted to fulfilling this mission. Through Jesus' great name, all the peoples of the earth can be saved. There's no other name under heaven by which we can be or must be saved. Call on the name of Jesus and you will be saved. If you are saved, then you are called, you are transformed, you are sent. Fear and anxiety, worrying about what you're going to eat or what you're going to wear or what you're going to do, how you're going to protect all the stuff you've accumulated in this world, that's self-preservation and it's overrated. That is a life of smallness. That's not a life of greatness. Trying to figure out how to protect your furniture from bugs or how to keep your patio from growing those little weeds between the grout. I like getting rid of that stuff, but it's not my calling. My sheep hear my voice, they know me and they follow me, Jesus says. You must cultivate a life of faith now. When you hear that call, you gotta follow now or you're gonna miss greatness. You're going to miss the great Abrahamic departure adventure. Remember Christian Bunyan's, uh, in Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, he hears the call and he sets out towards the celestial city and all the different things he encounters along the way. His eye is on the prize. God will tell Abraham soon that I am your very great reward. God is your reward. He is who called you. He is who made you. He will sustain you. But he wants you to bridge that gap and go on mission. To be inviting, to be telling people, to be living a life of faith. Calling is a critical part of your salvation. Every person who is saved and effectively transformed has been called. A new heart's been put in you joining you to Christ. It's this call that is responded to out of faith. This place is full of significance and safety and true greatness will find itself only in this call. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for the call that you put upon our lives. We thank you for the way that you have blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. We thank you for the faith of Abraham. We pray that you would instruct us by it. We pray that you would transform us Send us and help us to rely on nothing but Jesus Christ for our salvation. Help us to leave behind the things that are lesser and find greatness in you. We thank you for this word that redefines everything for us and is able to save our souls. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing our song of response. Praise him, praise him.
reach out your hands and receive the blessing of God. May the compassion of God satisfy you in the morning with his steadfast love so that you may rejoice and be glad all your days. May the favor of the Lord our God be upon you, and may the work of your hands prosper. Amen.